Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to be here and presenting this material. Uh, my name is uh, Dave Turcott. Um, I'm a, a research professor at UMass Lowell and I direct the Healthy Homes Training Program and the Healthy Homes Training Center. And I've been uh, working on projects with asthma for many years. And in addition, I've been uh, working with the um, National Healthy Homes Training Center since 2012, and we've been uh, doing trainings for them around New England. So the material we're going to pre we're presenting today is going to cover two of the principle principles of healthy homes, healthy housing that was developed by the National Center for Healthy Homes, and we're going to cover keep it clean and keep it pest free today, and we'll cover four more on the next couple couple of weeks. And a lot of my work at the university also involves intervention research with um, families with young children with asthma as well as older adults with asthma. So why don't we begin? So the first um, thing we're gonna focus on is keeping it clean. And, you know, it's important, um, you know, that something is cleanable and easy to clean because, you know, you can reduce a lot of the contaminants that could be in the home environment from chemicals to variety of allergens, pest droppings in urine, pesticides, uh, in worst case, heavy metals, as well as help reduce harborage or comfortable places for pests to nest and hide. And there's a lot of, uh, for folks who are familiar with asthma and allergies, there's a lot of um, allergens out there that you would uh, see potentially in the home that would make its way in the home one way or another. So this is the list of several of them, some of the more common ones. Um, this photo on the lower right, um, you cannot see dust mites, but they're very handsome as you can see, and uh, you can only see them under a microscope, but um, they like humidity and they also function well in, in dry buildings and they eat the, de the, the dead skin of people and animals, but they can you know, lead to the development of asthma as well as trigger and worsen someone's asthma condition. On the upper left-hand side, uh, you see, you know, someone's bed, cushy pillows, uh, stuffed um, animals, and dust mites love to get into things like this. So it's something to be aware of if you're not already aware of it. So one way to control, several ways you can control dust mites. Uh, you can't eliminate them completely, but you can keep the humidity below 50%. That will um, um, prevent them from proliferating. You want to wash the bedding. Um, we recommend weekly. Yeah, if hot water prefer is preferred, but research shows that it, a lot of bed bugs are killed just washing in, in cold water also. You can use special mattress and pillow in cases that will, you know, if the um, bed bugs are in the mattresses or pillows, that will protect the person with asthma from them. Um, small little stuffed toys, you can stick them in the freezer or outside in the winter when it's below um, freezing and that will kill them. Over, and um, also, you know, replacing carpets with hard surfaces, you know, and things that are kind of cushy, you know, heavy drapery, upholstery, and other, other places where dust mites like to uh, hang out and grow. So, you know, how does dust get into the home? Um, often it's brought in, you know, we track it in with our feet, not closed. Um, it can be homegrown, you know, as folks who are familiar with the lead uh, poisoning and lead dust issues. I mean, it's in the paint, it's in the home already. Um, it, it decays, gets into the dust. Dust mites, you know, will proliferate in the home as we've talked about. And then again, clutter and garbage just, you know, lead to more dust accumulation. So one of the approaches we recommend is using a four step process to kind of reduce dust being tracked into the home. So you it, first step is having some kind of hard surface, you know, in the entryway outside where you can kind of bang your shoes and bang your feet. So you leave a lot of it outside. Also having an outside grate like mat, which you see there, which I'll show you a better photo in a second. Then the third thing would be is an inside carpet pad. So you can 
You can uh, wipe your feet like um, this cat is wiping its paws before it comes in the home, it's well trained. And then have a hard surface in the home, which is easier to clean than wall to wall carpet. So this is a, a photo of the grate that I showed you outside just before entering through the door. Um, so because there's holes in it, you know, if you're banging your shoes and wiping your shoes, the dirt will fall into that. And uh, instead of being tracked into the home. This is another approach. Um, you know, certain uh, cultures um, customarily take their shoes off when they enter the home. So they have a shoe rack at the entranceway where people can take off their shoes and, and put it there. That's another strategy you can use to minimize um, dust and dirt being brought into the home. Um, then you, know, you wanna follow healthy cleaning practices. You don't wanna be doing dry dusting or dry sweeping. That's just gonna generate all the allergens and dust into the air. So anyone with asthma will be inhaling it. Um, vacuuming can, can, you know, can be good. You wanna have a vacuum that doesn't give off emissions. Um, and you, a beta bar, which I'll show you in a, in a few minutes, is another good thing to help um, remove allergens and dirt and dust from the of carpets. And again, the slower you vacuum, the more dust and dirt you pick up, which I'm going to show you a little um, graph to kind of emphasize that point. And then wet cleaning hard surfaces, you know, is, a, is another good strategy that's part of a healthy cleaning regimen. So the key is you want to make your home or buildings more cleanable. So again, the kind of walk-off system I showed you is important. Um, if, you have, if you have to do anything that does create dust, do it away from people, particularly individuals, children or older adults with asthma. You know, again, smooth and cleanable is better. You want to have some good storage areas, which I'll show you some examples. And again, the easier to clean the floor, the better. And you want to have a good um, vacuum with like a HEPA filter is what we recommend to remove a lot of the allergens and dirt and dust effectively. Uh, this is something that we, we recommend you do not do. You do not let pets go on the beds in the bedroom of asthmatics because you know, their allergens could, or anything they bring in could um, trigger an asthma attack, worsen an asthma condition. Um, this is an example of a you know, vacuum cleaner. And the beater bar is the thing that spins you know, under the vacuum, under this um, face of the vacuum that I'm showing you. And by hitting the carpet, it, it, it knocks up the dust in the carpet and it gets sucked into the vacuum. So if you can imagine, I'm sure you've seen this, when sun is shining in through the outside onto the couch and someone just sits down on the couch and all of a sudden you see all this dust come up, that's kind of the same approach that the beater bar does. It, you know, but before the dust can come up in the air, it's sucked into the vacuum. So that's why it's effective to have a vacuum like that. But you also want to make sure it's you know, strong enough to, you know, to be removing the dust and the dirt from the floor and the carpet. And again, a HEPA filter, you know, type filter is what we recommend. And the dirt senses, most people get frustrated with them because they always stay on because you really have to clean an area well to remove all the dirt and dust, which I'm gonna show you in a second. This is a, a graph from a research study that was done in Denmark. And what it's showing you is on the left side, you know, the, the um, vertical graph is showing you how many grams of dust and dirt it picked up and the time it took. And this, in this study, they only, um, were, they were vacuuming a one square meter area which is a little more than a one square yard area. And it took 40 minutes of vacuuming one square meter on a dirty carpet to basically saturate you know, the vacuum and remove all of the dirt and dust that was in that one square meter. So the quicker you vacuum you know, um, a rug or a carpet, the less dirt and dust you're actually picking up. So it's important to, you know, to recognize that. That's why we don't recommend you know, carpeting if, if possible. It's more difficult to clean and remove everything. Here's an example of wire shelving, which is actually better. This is easier to clean and it accumulates less dust than if it was just a solid surface, which can accumulate a lot more dust. And 
one of the things that doesn't really exist out there is some kind of standard for allergens or standard for dust. The only kind of um, standard that there is in regarding to determining if something is really clean is the lead standard. And actually it was just improved and strengthened. So in order to have a home that is gonna be lead, abate, lead, lead abated in the future, um, that it's going to have to be, um, whatever's on a, a square foot on the floor has to be less than 10 micrograms of lead per square foot. It used to be 40, they just improved it and made it more stringent. And the same thing with the windowsill, it used to be um, um, 400, and I'm sorry, 250 and now it's 100. Um, but that outside of that, there's no standard, you know, it exists for regular dust or allergens or nothing like that. So you might think, well, carpet clinging is a good way to go. It can be, but you got to be careful about carpet clinging because often the chemicals that are used in the clinging process are strong. And we'll talk about them in a later um, webinar, but that can worsen someone's asthma condition. You know, overuse of antimicrobials. I mean, we have a pandemic right now, so people are using sanitizers and things like that, but it, normally you don't want to use it um, when you're not in this kind of pandemic situation, overuse it because you can build up resistance and there's chemicals in there that also off gas that could worsen, you know, someone's asthma condition or someone with a sensi sensitive respiratory condition. The air fresheners, they make the environment smell good, like it's clean, but in reality, you're smelling chemicals, which could worsen someone's asthma condition. Um, another thing that people think needs to be done on a regular basis is cleaning ducts. Uh, the, the EPA only recommends you clean the ducts if you have these conditions. Either there's a lot of mold that's visible in the duct, or the ducts are infested with pests, or uh, you know, or they you know um, clogged, so you're not getting good um, air entrance. And also, if you can see particles coming out of the ducts, and that's another situation where you would want to clean your ducts. But other than that, you don't need to clean them unless you know these conditions are present. Same thing with clutter; it's a problem because you know dust and dirt can accumulate. And we'll be, it's also a problem when we get into keep it pest free. Um, what do we do? To, you know, to help. Um, you know. You, Sometimes you have to work with people around organizing and cleaning and getting up, cleaning up the clutter in their homes. Um, you might have to give them, you know, some tips and help them organize so there's less clutter and things are easier to clean. As you may have already run into, you know, often people have hoarding tendencies, and often that's a psychological issue, and they just accumulate things, accumulate things, and it's almost impossible to keep their home clean under those circumstances. And I just realized, um, surely, that we didn't release the poll, <laughs> the first poll we were going to do. So I think we should just skip it at this point and then release the one at the beginning of the pest, um, the pest keep it pest free portion of this. So basically, to kind of recap, the key messages when we talk about keeping it clean are you know, pesticides, allergens, you know, chemicals, all of this can cause allergic reaction, worsen someone's asthma condition, trigger an asthma attack, um, you know, also cause some other issues. But, you know, um, allergens and contaminants, you know, can come into the home from the outside, as we talked about, but it can also be an indoor source. So the key is, you know, number one, controlling the source preventing you know, the dust and dirt from getting in and preventing from things building up internally. Um, ideally, you wanna have a clean, smooth surface so that it's easy for you to clean. And you wanna you know, ensure that you don't allow clutter to build up. You wanna try reducing clutter, even though it some, can be difficult. And uh, certainly you wanna use effective cleaning methods like we've talked about, you, know, you don't wanna be Sweeping, you want to be using uh, damp mops and and uh, damp, damp cloths to cling and things like that. So, Shirley, maybe you could release the uh, the poll. So, I would like you to you know just kind of quickly answer this 
poll, you know, the question is, what are the most common pests seen in the homes that you have visited? One cho first choice is bed bugs, cockroaches, dust mites, mice, and rats. So just pick the most common one you've witnessed when you've gone into homes. Well, we still have um, nine people who haven't voted yet. <laughs> Still time to vote. Right now, dust mites are uh, in the number one position. So Dave, I can't take the poll since I'm running the poll. Oh, okay. So I will, uh, I'm gonna end it in- Well, no, I just wanted to share that um, what I've seen lately in my own home have, I've had, I had a huge problem with mice. Okay. Yeah, I mean, mice are common. Um, Cockroaches are common. Um, dust mites, I mean, you can't see them unless you have very excellent vision, like where you can see microscopic things, but people know that they have dust mites. So I think that's how they're responding. Um, but I'm gonna, um, so the results then are, you know, bed bugs, you know, people haven't seen bed bugs. Cockroaches, 24%. Um, dust mites, 43% of, of the homes. Uh, I mean, 43% of the individuals saw that as the most common thing they see. 33% uh, said mice was the most common pest they see in the home, and then no one for rats. Okay. So we're going to get into pest-free now. It's not the most pleasant topic to be uh, talking about, but that's the reality, as you can see from the poll and your own experience. It's, um, it's, it's very common. So, you know, the problem with the, you know, pests is they can exacerbate asthma. They can, uh, you know, spread infectious diseases. And then children are particularly more vulnerable uh, to, to being exposed to pests. This is an example of a child, a young child who was bitten by rats. Um, and, you know, it's still something that happens in urban areas in particular. Every year, thousands of children get bitten by rats in the United States. But when you're thinking about, you know, how to control pests, this is what we call the pest triangle. You know, pests need water like we do. They need food and they need a comfortable place to nest and hide. So what, you know, you don't want to do is create, you know, conditions, can do what we call conducive conditions to attracting pests and maintaining pests in the home environment. So, and as we talked about in general, this was a survey done, you know, American housing survey done by the census and every uh, couple of years. And this was the results of 2015 when they asked a lot of questions about pests. So in all housing, you know, it was similar, cockroaches and mice, were you know present in close to 11 to 12 percent of the homes, but if in homes of people living in, in below poverty, you know you can see cockroaches were dramatically higher at 18.4 percent, and and mice and rats at you know, a little more at 13 percent. And in some places, where there's been studies done in the past, you know, in a study done in Philadelphia in 2007, 62 percent of the homes had cockroach problems. 72% mice. And then a national um, study that was done over a four-year period saw, you know, mice allergens at, you know, 63% of the homes, but in the low-income homes, it was actually 95% and 85% in co for cockroaches. But what happens is, you know, if pests are not being controlled by the landlord, let's say, effectively in their pest company, then people often will go get anything, even things that are unsafe. Um, you know, they might apply too many 
which can be harmful to people in the home as well as children. And, um, and they often are able to access the wrong kind as well as unsafe and illegal types, which I'm gonna show you in a second. This is a picture of one, which is illegal in the United States, but it's been found in Massachusetts in a neighborhood grocery stores in the past. It is also thousands of poisons from pesticides every year. And, um, and, and the research shows that pesticides that people have in the home are often stored in easy reach of children. And again, 95% of all poisonings from pesticides involve children under six years old. So there's two types of approaches. There's the conventional approach and something called IPM or integrated pest management, which we recommend, which I'm gonna explain over the next several present slides. So conventional is you're just reacting to the pest. You know, you notice the problem, so you come out. Uh, there's a little minimal education of residents involved. You know, traditionally there's extensive spraying or using of foggers to kill um, pests. And they usually are on a schedule where they come in every so often and automatically do it. And then if you're talking about rodents, you know, then they were using poisons. When you take the IPM approach, you're trying to prevent the problem in the first place. So you want to be proactive. You know, there's extensive education in, in, with the residents as well as the landlords and the um, pest control companies. Um, spraying would be frowned upon. We would never recommend it normally unless in some extreme situation. And instead of poisons, it would be, you know, excluding pests, blocking their entries and, and trap or trapping them. So this kind of shows you, you know, when you're thinking about pest often, it's like, well, we're going to kill them. But really what you want to do is you want to reduce what we call the carrying capacity in the environment, which means that if there's no food, water, or a comfortable place for them to nest and, and stay and hide, then they're not going to stay. They're going to either die or they're going to move. So that's what you're really aiming for. So the first step is you want to inspect you know, you want to identify what the specific pest is that you have. You want to exclude them, deny entry. You want to, again, provide education to the residents and others involved. You want to practice good sanitation, which attracts and provides food for them to, so they can keep surviving and reproducing. You want to use different kinds of physical controls. And you want to monitor the, what you're doing to ensure that everything, all your, what you're doing is being successful. So this is a picture of where there's some holes and cracks around the pipe, and that's an easy entry point for mice and cockroaches. And that little black thing on the, to the right in the photo is supposed to be a bait. You know, for, it's for cockroaches, but even a mouse could squeeze through that kind of opening because um, they can squeeze through you know, a hole the size of a dime. So the key of inspection is looking for any evidence, like you see here, it's a dead cockroach, but you're also looking for places pests could enter. So you can see there's a lot of holes and cracks around these pipes, there's holes in the walls. So pests could easily enter uh, through those openings. Um, and you wanna you know, look to see you know, any signs of pests, live or dead, droppings, you know, um, see if any, you know, mice droppings or cockroach trash or droppings. You wanna look for holes for potential nests. Um, food and water sources, you wanna look for any that they could be tracked or sustained by, hiding places, you know, entry points, um, warm, comfortable places that cockroaches particularly like. So here's an example of, you know, where exclusion is needed, you know, this, doorstop is broken, you really should replace it because cockroaches and mice can squeeze under that side where it's open. Um, so you want to, you know, again, stop the entry. So any holes, any kind of places they could enter, you need to take some action to block the entry. Stuff it is kind of like, um, we use what we call copper mesh, which is, you know, they're not able to bite through it, you know, mice can't bite through it, rats can't bite through it, you just stuff it in the holes and the openings around pipes and it effectively blocks any of these pests from coming in. You can also use caulking, but some mice and rats could sh uh, chew through the caulking. Um, but again, education is important. You have to understand your pests 
Um, you know, rats are different from mice, mice are different from cockroaches. So to really control them, you got to understand them. And you got to understand, you know, what they are, how they get in, what sustains them, when they usually come out, things like that. Um, you want to be sure you're aware of the safe and unsafe practices. And again, the residents need to be educated. You want to choose a um, pest control organization or company, which PCO means. And you want to make sure they understand what IPM is. They understand you know, how to effectively control pests without spraying pesticides around. And often you have to train the pest control organizations also on these methods. Many do know now, but others don't, or others say they do and they don't practice integrated pest management or IPM. Sanitation is extremely important. Most mice, you know, rats and you know, cockroaches, they come out at night. So if people leave dirty dishes out there like this, they come out at night and they feast. And they, you know, these, this is, you know, a common practice where people leave dirty dishes out or food out then they're going to come out every night and they're going to have a feast every night and they're not going anywhere and they're going to continue to reproduce and the situation is only going to get worse. So you want to make sure that you don't, there's no water or food or no comfortable places for them to hide, which is you know, what we talk about with, with the word harborage. So, and again, you got to understand the differences. Cockroaches or other kinds of similar insects and rats you know, water is essential for them. They need water. Um, mice don't. Mice get pretty much the water they need from the food they eat. And bed bugs, I mean, their only interest is blood, as you may know, so they don't need water. Mosquitoes obviously love water and, you know, um, water that's um, just standing water is, is a great place for them to nest and reproduce. And water, you know, also leads to structural damage which leads to more cracks and holes, which leads to easier entry points for pests. So that's why you wanna be concerned about, you know, controlling water and water sources. And then, you know, you can use, you know, physical controls. Uh, that's again, identifying and accessing how they're coming in and, and doing, taking action to block those entry points. And again, you wanna follow, you know, the integrated pest management strategy with all of these pests, regardless, but you're going to use different tactics, you know, because as we mentioned, um, you know, cockroaches are smaller than mice and smaller than rats, and the cockroaches can get in and, and, and usually travel in places that mice and rats may not. So, you, so you're going to have to use different tactics and different items, you know, which I'm going to talk about to control them. So these are some examples of some things uh, you can do that are much safer than um, spreading, you know, spraying um, pesticides or using foggers. Now there, there are pesticides in these cockroach gels, excuse me, but when you're using gels or using cockroach baits, again, you wouldn't use the, the baits or the gels with mice or rats. They're only designed you know, for cockroaches. So when you're using the cockroach baits, you're gonna put them in places where the cockroaches are likely to travel, um, but you wanna put them in places that children and pets in the home cannot come in contact with them. So there's, you know, there's no harm that they can and, um, receive from those baits. The same thing with the gels. The gels are usually used in, cracks and corners in certain places where children or pets wouldn't have access to, maybe under cabinets that might be locked or um, you know, behind refrigerators or places where there could be entry points or nesting points. Um, and then in the case of glue boards and snap traps, you, know, you, you would use them with mice or rats. Uh, there are some uh, sticky traps, we call them for cockroaches, which I'll show you a picture of, but uh, the bigger glue boards and the snap traps are used when you're following integrated pest management to, to catch rodents. And again, if you're going to put a snap trap out there, you want to you know, put it in a place as well as the glue boards where children won't be playing with it. So here's an example of illegal pesticides, that, and these have been found in Massachusetts in the past. Um, 
And you don't want to have any kind of pesticides. It looks like, you know, candy. So some people use mothballs, which isn't that effective. Um, or they have um, candy, um, you know, pesticide balls that, um, you know, children are going to put in their mouth thinking it's candy. The Chinese chalk, which is up at the top here, um, it looks like a candy bar. And then uh, tres pasitos means three little steps. And basically, you know, it's so, supposed to be so strong that the pest who comes in contact with it will die within three steps away from once they ingest the, um, you know, the pesticides. So these are all illegal pesticides in the United States, but they are used in other countries and people bring them in and they sell them, you know, in the communities that might be familiar with them or might've seen them in the country they came from. And if they get frustrated, you know, they just say, well, these, we know tres pasitos are gonna kill pests. So we're gonna use them because the landlords and the pest company isn't doing a good job. So, you know, all the pesticides in the United States that are legal have to be registered with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. So it has to have a product name on the label. It has to have a registration number. It has to tell you what the active and inert ingredients are, some kind of warning to keep out of the reach of children, what to do for first aid if someone ingests it, you know, or an animal ingests it, how much content there is in it. And then you're going to see different kinds of uh, caution words. Caution means that, you know, you want to be careful, but it's, it's not as extremely dangerous as if you see a poison in skull and crossbone on the packet, that is like the extreme. So the bottom here where it says poison, skull and crossbone, that's the most dangerous type of uh, product that you could encounter and you wouldn't want to bring it into your home. Then the next level of danger, you know, we'll say danger, the next level of risk and danger would be warning and then caution. So it's important that, you know, that you, you know, if you bring any kind of pesticides in your home that you're trying to use pesticides, it will have, you know, cause the least harm to you and your family as well as, um, you know, be effective on some level, but these baits are very effective. The research, it shows that the, bell, the gels and bakes, uh, baits are more effective than the traditional spraying and fogging, which just kind of drives the cockroaches into the walls and then they come out, you know, later. But with this, they take the baits and they take the gels back to the nest and then over a couple of week period, it will wipe them out usually, unless you've got a very severe infestation. So the last thing you want to be doing is monitoring on a regular basis. So that picture on the lower right is an example of, you know, one of these sticky traps that have been put out and you can tell there's a serious infestation of cockroaches just by everything that was caught in the sticky trap. Once they get on it, they can't get off of it. So um, you want to spread these around in different places where you think it's likely there could be cockroaches, certainly in the kitchen, the bathroom, children's bedrooms is another good place because often they eat in their bedrooms and they leave food for, to, to, that the pest will eat. Um, you want to place them in corners under the sink, you know, you want to put the date in my, you know, so you know how long it's been out there and that's how you can monitor. So if something's out there for a week and you catch one cockroach, you know, you got a small problem right now, but if you put it out for a week and you see this, then you know, you got a serious problem, but you probably would have seen, you know, other indications of a serious problem, you know, with the frass, which is the combination of the urine and the droppings of the cockroaches, which I'll show you a photo of it in a few minutes. But once you put these um, sticky traps out, you don't want them being disturbed. Again, you got to put them somewhere where children and pets can't get into them. So here's some examples of, you know, different kind of traps uh, that would be used with, um, with mice. Um, and again, you want to understand your, um, your pest. So mice are very curious and they're very insecure and they don't like being out in the middle of a room. They like to run along the sides of walls. They like to be in tight places because they like to have their whiskers feel something on the side of them. That's what makes them psychologically secure. Um, so when you're putting out traps like this and you're trying, you're trying to catch a mouse, 
you want to put it up against the wall because that's where they run because they like to, again, have their whiskers brush up against something like a wall. You want to check them daily. You know, if, if, it's, if it's not being successful, you might have to put out more traps. But again, you want to always monitor, you know, um, for these traps and see if you're catching things. And obviously you don't want to leave dead mice uh, in these traps too long. And again, as I mentioned, it's key to know your, pe your pest. So there's different kinds of cockroaches. The most common cockroach you would find within multifamily housing in this area are the German cockroaches. Uh, you can see them on the lower left-hand side. Now, what this is showing you, what you know, it's showing you the kind of the life cycle of a German cockroach. So at the bottom middle of that lower photo, that's like the egg where they come out of. And what ends up happening is they end up shredding, shedding their skin um, six times by the time they reach adulthood. And that, you know, which gets shedded in the environment is something that could trigger an asthma attack or worsen an asthma attack. So it's not just the um, urine or the droppings from the cockroaches, also their allergens, the shell itself of their skin can cause, um, you know, asthma to worsen for someone that comes in contact with it. And again, as we talked about, you know, cockroaches can spread diseases too, like rodents. And you wanna be clear on where they like to hide. They like to hide in walls. They like to hide under refrigerators. They like, they like eating grease. So keep, again, sanitation is important. Um, they like cracks. So this is kind of showing you the pyramid. So the most risky thing is chemical spraying of pesticides, which is at the top. You know, you want to maintain, you know, you want to have good sanitation, keep food and water sources away. You want to, you know, use physical, mechanical um, approaches, you know, traps, screens. You want to use caulking. You want to clog in entry points. You could use biological approach. So in, with, with a mouse, a biological approach would be having a cat who would, you know, be hunting mice. But you know, cats are domesticated, so often they, you know, that may not be an effective approach. Um, but with cockroaches, there's something here listed called the uh, nematode, which is like a, a thin worm that does kill cockroaches and other kinds of insects by injecting a, a lethal bacteria into them. So, but I don't think people would want to use that and want to have worms in their home <laughs> to, in order to deal with the cockroach problem. Um, but there's the less riskier things to do would be put out the baits and the traps that I mentioned earlier. And then something called boric acid dust, um, which you can use, but you don't want to use it where children can get into it because it could, they could get sick coming in contact with it. But it's not a pesticide, but it, it can kill them. It's usually used when apartments are being changed over. And, you know, there's a period of time where, you know, the, they're cleaning it up, getting it ready for the next tenant. And if there's been a cockroach problem, they can put the dust around, leave it out there, kill all the cockroaches, then clean it up before the next family moves in. Here's some examples of what we call the cockroach frass, which is like the mixture of the urine and the, and the droppings. Um, so they get behind wallpaper because they like tight things. They, they can get up on top of doors. Um, the brown uh, band cockroach, which was in the photo earlier with the German cockroaches, they like to climb up high. They like climbing on top of doors and they like climbing up walls and getting behind clocks. So you can see that photo with a clock on the right hand side. And then you see to the, just diagonally to the left of it below, that's the frass. That frass was under that, behind that clock on the wall. So you would have never known that cockroaches was you know, nesting and staying behind there unless you pulled the clock off the wall. And that's what you see here is the frass behind the clock. Again, this is, um, you know, sticky traps, you know, catching it. So you want to monitor, you want to use, you know, caulkings and dust, you know, baits and gels. Um, there are some things that can also in inhibit the growth and reproduction of cockroaches and so forth but um, you know, they're not easy to work with. And then sticky traps we talked about. Uh, you don't know how difficult it was for us to get this helmet on this mouse. 
in part of, part of for us to take this photo, but um, you know, rodents are like us, we're, they're mammals actually, they're not insects. And you gotta understand how the rodents think to, you know, to effectively deal with them. So mice are very curious and persistent. So they're actually easier to trap than, than, the, um, than rats because rats are cautious and smart. And often you gotta put out traps for rats and, and don't set them so they get comfortable with them and then set them. And that's the best way to catch them. And this just shows you kind of the difference between like mouse feces and rat feces. Even though a young rat might not that be that much larger than a, than a mouse, but yeah, as you can see, the mice feces are very small and, and narrow and tiny, and the rat feces is much larger. So that's just an indication to help you know which problem you may have. And again, the problem with mice is this is showing you that a pregnant you know, mouse, you know, at the end of the year, if if you know if the mice that they uh, deliver have mice and more mice, you could have one mice leading to 4,000 mice over the course of one year. They reproduce quickly. So you want to address any kind of mouse problem immediately. Um, these are some photos of um, the upper left is um, rat droppings that we got inside the wall cavity. And then the upper right is a, a holes that um, rats burrowed into clay walls in the basement. And then the lower left, it looks like a water stain, but it's actually a mouse a mice urine stain, a mouse urine stain, because uh, there was a nest up in the ceiling above this um, panel. And the problem with mice uh, that um, they have weak bladders. So when mice are running around someone's home, they're, they're dropping urine as they're running around. It's not a pleasant thought, but that's the unfortunate reality. So when they nest, they the same thing. They you know they're dropping urine. They're, you know, all the time on a, a regular basis. So it stains through and it may, you know, stain like that. And then the lower right is like an open uh, poison bait that's unsecured, which is dangerous. We would never recommend that because, um, you know, animal, uh, children or uh, uh, pests, I mean, pests, pets, your pets can get into that also. Um, you know, these are things that don't work, you know, contact sprays, Foggers, they're not that effective. The mothballs, some people say, oh, the sound, ultrasound will not, you know, get rid of all your, your rodents and your cockroaches. They're really not that effective. Dryer sheets aren't either. Um, there are some things that have some level of, you know, effectiveness. People have made their own things. Um, um, you might have seen them. Gadgets, these are like to catch more like bed bugs, basically. Um, um, so bed bugs, I, I know people said they haven't seen bed bugs. They, they, they're visible, but they're hard to see. Um, you know, they bite, they irritate the skin. You can see them, unlike the dust mites. Um, they do not cause or spread disease, but they suck your blood and, and they can cause in, in irritation. Uh, you don't need pesticides to kill them. You can kill them with extreme heat, will kill them. And it's a safer uh, approach than spraying pesticides or putting pesticides around to deal with um, a bed bug problem. This is an example of you know trying to. This is a mattress encaser, which is good against you know bed bugs, but you can also get the kind that are good against um, dust mites, which will also help you with the bed bugs. But this is a trap uh, where they basically they put them on the bottom of the legs around the beds. And they put like some kind of oil or, or gel in, 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 in around it inside the container. So you have like it between the outer wall and the center well. And it's both, and it generally can prevent the bed bugs from like, you know, crawling up the, um, the bed um, leg and into the mattresses. And again, you know, you still want to do inspections. It's the same approach with even with the bed bug issue. Because they're so small, you can vacuum them, you know, up. You can, they will, you know, they can be frozen also and killed. But um, if you put a mattress outside in the winter in your mattress, you know, you may kill them. But, you know, then your mattress is going to be cold when you bring it back in. Um, but if you don't, you don't want to apply any pesticides in your own home for bed bugs, you definitely want to deal with a pest control company. But again, we recommend that you 
you know, you try the encases and the interceptors or you use heat, but you don't use pesticides. These are some sources, uh, you know, um, good websites that provide good information. Um, and, you know, this is pretty much, you know, the wrap up, the key of what um, we, you know, the message we want you to take away from today, which is, you know, pests create a lot of allergens and they're, and they, you know, spread disease. And if you're using pesticides, you know, that can lead to poisonings and other neurological problems, particularly in children. And many pesticides that have been found in the home are banned in the US now. And you don't want to have a, you know, a house that's comfortable and attractive for pests. So you want to make sure all the entry points are blocked. You want to make sure you're not leaving food and water around or comfortable places for them to nest and shelter. And you want to follow the strategies from integrated pest management. So at this point, um, this is my last slide. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great. Thank you, Dave, for that presentation. Um, one of the first questions that was mentioned and I answered um, was, um, we'll, we'll be able to share the slide presentations. Um, so we will post that on our website and send out the link for that and as well as the um, recording. Um, yeah, and I actually, I should put my contact information on here, which isn't actually, <laughs> so that people would have that too, but I'll add that. Okay, thank you, Dave. And then um, I don't know if you reviewed this, but um, somebody had a question as to what do droppings of roaches look like? Well, I showed pictures of that. Um, it's like a brownish, um, Right here, that's this is droppings of roaches, but it's get the, the urine gets mixed in with it. We call it frass, F R A S S, but that's what it looks like. Are there any other, any other questions? Mm. Whoops. <laughs> Just give it a few more minutes to see if anybody yeah. has any questions. Yeah, but it's not a pleasant topic, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone left the uh, presentation, but. <laughs> No, I don't think you scared anyone off. <laughs> um, I just want to remind everyone that um, a certificate of attendance is available upon request um, after the completion of the webinar series. So you can email me at srodriguez at publichealthwm.org um, to request one, and I'll put my email in the, the chat. And if you haven't signed up for any of the other presentations, um, we have two more remaining. Dave, do you want to um, share what those topics are? Yes. Um, the next um, one is going to, well, let me, uh, <laughs> I should know this, but um, <laughs> we're going to get into um, ventilation and um, is embarrassing. I can't remember now the, how I divided up the topics, but <laughs> but it's the next uh, four, the next two um, topics, next two principles that uh, I showed at the beginning here. So let me just get up there. I'll, I'll pull those up. There is a question in the chat. Um, how many times do you consider that it's not working after 15 times of exterminating what other solutions well when when the person says exterminating i'm assuming they mean spraying pesticides or applying pesticides you know liquid pesticides around um the, we would recommend again you got to think about what's your pest problem and you want to think about well how are they getting in here and can you close any of the entry points 
Because if you never deal with the entry points, they're always going to come back at some point. Um, and you want to, um, you know, use, you can use pesticides, you know, but we approach it as use pesticides as a last resort. resort. And you want to, you know, eliminate water and food that attracts them and sustains them. And you want to, you know, block any entry points. And if you're going to use any kind of pesticides, let's say if it's a cockroach, then you would use the baits or, and the gels and you would put, you know, them in likely places where cockroaches go. So the best way to know where the likely places are is to use those sticky traps. And then where you see that you put them and there's a lot of cockroaches being caught, then those are the areas where they like to travel. And, and so if you can put gels and baits in those areas, likely they're gonna take them back to the nest and within a couple of weeks, they're going to kill most of them. Not all of them, but you gotta to continue to keep an eye on things. But we would, as I mentioned, we wouldn't be using the sprays or recommending that. I'm not sure if I'm answering that person's question. But. Let's see. Is the DIA, um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, DIA, DIA powder harmful to humans? Um, it, yeah, I would say you know, any kind of powders could be harmful to humans if they're being ingested. That's why if you're gonna use anything like you know, boric acid or another kind of a powder, you've gotta make sure they're putting, they're going, you're putting them in places where children you know, in particular could come in contact with them. And thank you, Alexandra. I see that you shared our next webinar, which is on keep it well ventilated and safe. Keep it safe. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And then the last one will be keep it contaminate, contaminant free and keep it maintained. Yes. But um, Any other questions? I'm glad to ha answer. If you think of any other questions that you'd like Dave to um, answer, you may um, reach out to me by, um, you know, just email me and I, I'll make sure that Dave gets, um, gets those questions. And Dave, I see a few thank yous and a great presentation. Hey, well, I'm glad people liked it and it was helpful.